Welcome to Zoe Science and Nutrition, where world-leading scientists explain how their research can improve your health. In Ethiopia, coffee berries have been ground up and boiled for thousands of years, where they were used to aid concentration during prayer. They arrived in Europe in the 17th century, and within a few years there were 3,000 coffee houses in England alone. Coffee quickly began to replace beer and wine as a favorite breakfast drink. Early coffee drinkers felt dramatically improved alertness and coordination by swapping the alcohol for caffeine. Handy when earning a living with your hands. However, it was also met with fear, with some church clergymen calling it the bitter intervention of Satan. In the 20th century, coffee was blamed for high blood pressure and heart attacks. More recently, Caffeine in coffee has been linked to a rising epidemic of poor sleep. None of this has prevented coffee's relentless rise. Today, over two billion cups of the stuff are drunk each day. So, is coffee a guilty treat, as many of us suspect? Or is it a health drink, feeding your good gut bacteria? My expert guests are here to set the record straight with the latest scientific evidence. I'm joined by James Hoffman, leading coffee expert and author of the World Atlas of Coffee, and my friend Tim Spector, one of the top 100 most cited scientists and my scientific co-founder at Zoe. In this episode, you'll learn how coffee affects your gut bacteria, your hormones, and your heart, whether decaffeinated coffee is healthy, and discover some of coffee's most surprising side effects, which could come in handy if you find yourself in the jungle. James and Tim, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Why don't we start with a quick fire round of questions based on uh, a whole bunch of questions we got from our listeners around coffee. Uh, starting with James, is there a best way to make coffee? No, there's a best way for you, but there's not an, a sort of best overall way. Does coffee affect your sleep? Yes, it does. Can you drink too much coffee? Uh, I mean, there's a lethal dose of caffeine, so about 150 espressos will kill you. But um, <laughs> so yes, yes, you can drink too much coffee. Okay, I'm guessing that most people don't hit that level. I would hope not. And finally, James, is coffee addictive? Complicated, but I'm going to say no. Tim? I think it depends how you define addiction. Um, certainly, if you stop having it, there are side effects. So by some definitions of addiction, it would, uh, it would meet those criteria, but clearly it's not like heroin. Brilliant. And Tim, is coffee a high fiber food? It is. It's probably the drink you, can, you have regularly that has, contains the most fiber. There's more fiber in it than a, a glass of orange juice. Are there coffee loving gut bacteria? There are indeed, and uh, Zoe's discovered some of them, yes. And you can tell a coffee lover just from looking at their poo. <laughs> oh, which is uh, a messy way to figure out whether someone likes yeah, coffee. Yeah, you could ask and, them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and last uh, question, which we'll go back into in more detail, but uh, is coffee healthy? For most people, it is uh, a healthy drink. Uh, for those that tolerate it well, yes. Excellent. And we'll, we'll come back and talk, I'm sure, a lot more about, about that. So why don't we start before that, James, with you just telling us what is coffee? And I guess also, why are we willing to spend, you know, $5 or three pounds on a single cup of it? Okay. Um, so coffee is ultimately the seed of a tropical uh, fruit uh, that grows on a shrub between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn around the world. At some point, we worked out that if we take this seed and ultimately roast it, smash it to little pieces and steep it in water, the resulting beverage is quite stimulating. And, and that was the sort of early beginnings of coffee. It's obviously evolved a great deal, especially in the last 10 or 20 years. And so a part of it is it has caffeine in it, and we like that. Uh, and I think we quickly grow to enjoy the taste, even though, you know, caffeine shouldn't be delicious. It's it's an insect repellent. Ultimately, that's its purpose in the plant. It's it's not supposed to encourage consumption, quite the opposite. But humans have a funny habit of, of uh, enjoying the things we're not supposed to. 
Um, uh, and so recently, coffee's become much more specialized, less commoditized. And we've discovered that where you grow coffee, the variety of coffee that you grow, the way that you roast it, the way that you brew it has an impact on flavor. And we can make it really very delicious and interesting. And I think it's become a, a sort of small luxury and delight in people's lives day to day, this sort of necessary stimulation that they might have wanted in the morning, a little injection of caffeine has become uh, an entertaining, enjoyable, tasty thing. And I think we're willing to spend money on that. Brilliant. And so I guess alongside this pleasure, there's been a lot of discussion back and forth, I think, uh, about whether coffee is good for you or or bad for you. Um, and so why don't we start to, to dig into that and um, both what we think now, but maybe a bit like what uh, I think some of us grew up with stories about how coffee was, was bad for us. What's the, what's the view today? Uh, I was brought up a, in, through medical school and as a junior doctor to really warn people off coffee that it was uh, bad for you. It was a, a stimulant that uh, overexcited your heart and that was probably a cause of uh, heart disease and heart failure, heart attacks, and particular abnormal rhythms of the heart. So, and I actually uh, also, it was also linked to cancer and uh, other things in the 1980s. And I even wrote a paper on it myself saying that uh, coffee caused cancer of the pancreas, which uh, was very good for my career, but was total rubbish uh, <laughs> in, in retrospect, uh, as, as much of epidemiology. Yeah, so it's only really, I think, the last five years that uh, the evidence has really accumulated so much that it, it's incontrovertible that uh, the studies are showing that uh, coffee drinkers have less heart disease than non-coffee drinkers. And there's certainly no excess in cancers or uh, mortality to suggest there was any any uh, real bad effects. Now, I think there's always a caveat to this, and there are some people who are very sensitive to caffeine who might uh, get a, a pulse that goes faster and they get some real effects of, of the caffeine, but it generally doesn't kill them or cause them any permanent damage, and they just know to avoid the drink. And that's why these long-term studies have shown that uh, not only is it safe, but it actually has protective properties on the heart. And do we have any idea what's going on, like why it might be, in fact, good for us rather than bad for us? We've got some idea, obviously, um, there are many chemicals in coffee that aren't just caffeine. And I think this is one of the, the sort of revelations of what we're discovering about foods is that we're fixated on one of hundreds of chemicals and think that, you know, define uh, coffee just by that uh, one chemical when in fact there's hundreds of others. And we think that the we've discussed fiber and uh, if people who do have, you know, three or five uh, cups of coffee a day are getting considerable amounts of fiber, which will uh, be of benefit. But it's probably other chemicals within the, the coffee that uh, have beneficial effects on uh, on the heart via our gut microbes. And these are the chemicals called polyphenols. So these are uh, the natural defense chemicals in most plants, but particularly ones uh, that are, are, have those bitter tastes and uh, dark colors that we find and is typically expressed in, in coffee. And so high concentration of these polyphenols are really like rocket fuel for your gut microbes and make them produce these beneficial chemicals that we think have, have these uh, amazing protective effects on the rest of the body, particularly our heart. We don't yet understand exactly how that happens. So this is still the, uh, a working hypothesis. And James, any amazing experiences about the, the health properties of coffee as you've been traveling around the world? That's a good question. I, you know, I think it's, um, it's interesting the way that different cultures have embraced coffee. I think, you know, discovering that they were giving coffee to school kids aged eight in Brazil was sort of shocking to me at one point because we have this sort of like, oh, no, it's a grown up thing. It's an adult thing. It's not that good for you. And I think other countries are like, no, it's 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 fine. What's what's wrong with you? Um, uh, health wise, it, it's definitely an interesting one. I think it's uh, as, as someone immersed in coffee 
you you just see a lot of claims on both sides. And, and I think it, it's often bewildering even for someone inside the industry to understand exactly what's going on and what's good, what's bad, antioxidants, all of those kind of things that you see around there. And it's a conversation that I'm often hesitant to get drawn into because there is so much misinformation around it. I, sh I should just add there's as a sort of caveat that the, the health data show that if you have, it's healthy between about one and five cups of coffee a day as soon as you get to six or more you seem to lose that benefit and uh, we don't really understand why that is but there might be a a nice dose you know a sort of safe threshold where the benefits outweigh any risks but like anything that has chemicals or you know uh, and has some mild addictive properties there might be a sweet spot that works um, for most people and, and of course, we're probably going to be talk about this more. There's quite a bit of personalization here in that, um, you know, the same cup of coffee is going to have a lot of very different effect on, on different people. Averages are, are, are can be deceptive. And so, you know, that's what epidemiology does. It takes a very broad average. But I think we need uh, to advise people down at the, the individual level. Well, I was just going to say, thinking about that, you know, caffeine is not quite at the level of sweetness, but it's one of the most studied compounds on earth kind of thing. We've, we've looked at it for a long, long time. And there are recommended guidelines for caffeine consumption of about 300 milligrams a day for, for an adult. And I wonder if by the time you hit five cups, you're probably exceeding that level. And essentially, while you might be getting some benefits of polyphenols, you're, you're beginning to see the downside of excess caffeine. And that's the sort of the, the tipping point, maybe. Yeah, no, I think that sounds very plausible. So we've got this magic drink that's pretty cool, full of fiber and polyphenols and all the rest of it, and it tastes good, James, which I think is uh, is is very important. Um, how's it made, right? You said it starts with a plant. I think for most of us, that's not really how we how we think about it. Um, and how does this process both affect its taste and and also what impact does that then potentially have on it on its health? Maybe you can sort of walk us through that from these uh, plants somewhere warm. Sure. Well, I'll start at the, the highest level. We mostly grow two different species of coffee. There's one that's considered superior, which you might have seen sort of uh, coffee shops using as a term, which is Cafe Arabica. So they'll say 100% Arabica, which is sort of the better of the two species. The other species we know as Robusta, it grows at lower altitudes. It's much hardier as a plant, in part because it produces twice as much caffeine, because caffeine, as I said, is an insect repellent. Uh, and, and so cheaper coffee actually has a lot more caffeine in it, which I think is something people don't really think about. And if you think about jumping to the end, cheaper coffees like Robusta tend to end up in things like instant coffee. So you're getting a higher dose of caffeine per sort of other potential benefits. Uh, typically speaking, I think um, some of the other things that are listed like antioxidants, I don't know where you stand on those, are seen as lower in uh, Robusta than Arabica. So generally speaking, higher quality coffee is, is considered better all, all around in a way. It's more complex, it's denser, it's better. So that's the starting point. We then take this, this fruit, we harvest it ripe, we squeeze the seeds out, and they sit in there, it's, it's sort of, it's like the fruit's like a small grape, and inside there's two seeds like a peanut, so facing each other, and that's why if you look at coffee beans, there's a sort of smooth side and a round side. Those ultimately get sort of processed and sorted and shipped to the country that will consume them usually, and that's where we would roast them. So they don't get roasted until they're usually in the country of consumption. Roasting has a massive, massive impact on the chemistry of the coffee bean. The thing that's good about it is that we create flavor at that point. If you try and drink raw coffee, it's not good. It's disgusting. It's it's just a hard plant seed. It has none of the flavors of coffee that we, we sort of experience. Um, it's got you know lo lots of things in there that seem good, but a lot of those react away during the roasting process. So when you roast coffee, and it can take anywhere from 90 seconds to 20 minutes to roast coffee, when you roast it, there's a, a sort of cascade of reactions that take place. A lot of them are involved in browning reactions, like the Maillard process, uh, you know, caramelization, a little bit of that, some Strecker so, degradation. So James, you're one. basically cooking these seeds. Is that what's going on? Yes, yes. So it, it's coffee roasters are, are sort of a hybrid of a, a very powerful oven and a tumble dryer. So you're sort of rolling these beans around in the heat. And then what coffee roasters are doing is very carefully controlling how much heat's going in because small changes to the rate at which you sort of roast the coffee has a massive impact on taste. And when you talk to people who deal with chocolate or with malt, it's, they're just like, no, no, you just get it, get it to go brown and it's finished. Coffee is very fussy. 
in terms of the roasting process. So it's hard to do well. From a taste perspective, and this is kind of important, the longer you roast coffee, the less acidity it will have. Because some people struggle with the acidity of coffee. It, it, it's going to be, a, a, I think, a topic for a little bit later. Uh, and the, But the more bitterness you will generate. And so roasting coffee is a kind of balance between keeping enough acidity that it feels interesting as a drink, because a little acidity in food is a wonderful thing, but not overwhelmingly sour, which people don't really like, but also not overwhelmingly bitter. And some people enjoy darker roasts th than others. There's no correct roast level from a taste perspective, but that's the trade-off. You'll lose complexity, lose acidity, and gain bitterness the longer you roast coffee. So that's roasting, which is, which is a complicated thing. So a good brew, getting a bit nerdy, but if you started with 20 grams of ground coffee, you want about 20% of that to end up in the cup below. That's, that's a good starting point. That's a good extraction. And we can measure that. We get very nerdy about that. Uh, how much water you use to do that makes different drinks and is kind of up to you. If you use just a little bit of water, that's kind of an espresso. It's a very strong end product. If you use more water to do the same thing, that's more like a filter coffee. And that's as delicious, but just a different kind of beverage. So there's no correct strength, but there is kind of good or bad brewing and extraction. And Tim, I hope you are measuring out the exact grams of water that you're adding onto your coffee, because I think James is going to be disappointed in you otherwise. That's my uh, my, my key takeaway at this point. <laughs> there's actually more caffeine, if I understand it, in a in a in a sort of weak filter coffee than there is an espresso. And so most people assume that a strong Italian espresso is going to keep them awake more than uh, a sort of American style uh, coffee. But when I did the calculations, it, it, it appears to be the opposite, that uh, you, know, you might be better off with an espresso if you want to uh, reduce your caffeine. How does that work? It's a good question. And, and What's frustrating is that you'll regularly see studies published where there seems to be no correlation between the beverage and the caffeine quantities. You know, they'll, they'll sort of secretly shop a bunch of chains in the UK and, and the caffeine content will be all over the place. Caffeine is very water soluble. So essentially the, the primary correlation is going to be how much coffee was used to make this drink. Now, in Italy, a single espresso might come from just seven grams of coffee. So you think, oh, not too much caffeine, but they tend to use a good amount of Robusta in their espresso blends, which has a lot more coffee in there. So, you know, with filter coffee, you might be brewing from, say, 15 grams of coffee for, for a 250 ml cup, but that might be, you know, high grown coffee, a pure Arabica. So not as much caffeine in the raw material, but that's the primary sort of correlation. How much coffee did you use? How much caffeine was in that coffee? Ultimately, the beverage is going to do a pretty good job of extracting the caffeine, regardless of whether it's a small drink or a big drink. So that's the sort of thing to think about when you're considering how much caffeine you're drinking. So it's pretty hard to tell for the average consumer and uh, just be beware and assume the worst if you don't want too much. Um, yeah, one one step of the process I just wonder if you could touch on is near to my heart is fermentation. Um, before I know you 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 love the roasting bit, but before that uh, stage, the fermentation, uh, how how important is that in the whole flavor complex? Is it as if, you know, like for chocolate, does it have such a big effect or not? Uh, so yes, yes, fermentation has a very big effect on flavor. I think just. To, to give context to it, a lot of decisions that coffee producers are making is not around taste. It's about getting uh, the best return they can on the crop that they've grown. So most fermentation techniques are about reducing incidences of defect or, or sort of flaws in the, in the coffee. There's a few different approaches. So as I said, we have this, this cherry, this fruit, and sometimes we're going to squeeze the seeds out and they'll still be covered in a little bit of sticky fruit flesh, for want of a better term. Uh, and what they would do is um, let that ferment for maybe 24 hours, either you know covered but with access to air or sometimes anaerobically, sort of covered in water, to break that down so that it's easy then to wash off. So you sort of have a clean seed to dry before export uh, that doesn't have much sugar lying around that, that won't go moldy, that won't have any kind of flaws come into it. And just for a second, just because we talk about fermentation from time to time, but can we explain a bit, you know, for our listeners, like what, what what's going on when we say it's fermenting for 24 hours? Can we explain a little bit more what, what's going on? Primarily, 
uh, what's happening, and, and a lot's going on with fermentation, so it's, it's, it's never something to say this, simply this. What we're trying to do is break down pectin in this particular case. So pectin is the sort of fruit fiber, um, is that a fair term to use? Uh, I was cautious. Uh, that's stuck to the seed. So what's happening there is microbes are breaking that down, consuming that uh, a, a sort of sugar, if I want to have a better carbohydrate, I suppose, at this point, uh, and, and essentially causing it to break down. There are flavor byproducts as a result, and there's an impact on all sorts of things from acidity to, to sort of just um, sort of the fruitiness of the coffee in some cases. In, in other cases, you know, this process does require quite a lot of water, and coffee has historically grown in places that maybe don't have a lot of access to water. There, historically, you would have seen that fruit picked and just dried. As a, as a piece of fruit, which is hard to do. There will be some fermentation there that historically is is kind of closer to kind of a controlled rot, for want of a better word. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of chaotic fermentation to just let a piece of fruit dry in the sun. Uh, it's, it's much harder to control. But once you've dried it down, you can sort of hull that sort of dry husk of the fruit off, and you've got access to a dry seed. The, the, the fermentation process once once coffee roasters get hold of it, we talk about it just from a flavor perspective. So we'll talk about the sort of more tropical fruit notes of a, a dry process or a natural process fermentation, whereas we might talk about the kind of cleaner, more refined kind of uh, juicy berry fruit notes or, or kind of um, uh, grape or apple or those kind of fruit notes that you would get from more of a washed processed coffee. And there's a hybrid that you might see called a, a pulped natural or, or a honey coffee where you sort of have this mixture of things and it has an impact on sweetness, on texture of your cup of coffee, that kind of mouthfeel, how full, how rich does it feel. Um, but obviously there's a lot more going on under the surface. And generally these are natural microbes just in the environment or do people add specific ones to the mix? Historically, it was natural microbes. Uh, these days, some of the modern winemaking techniques are coming in and there's sort of uh, additions of some uh, bacteria or enzymes to, to sort of uh, accelerate aspects of fermentation there, which is kind of interesting. And so there's now much more uh, controlled fermentation or, or sort of intentional fermentation happening. But ultimately, to go all the way back, historically, it was about how do I get the, the, the sort of most valuable crop at the end of this with the least cost to me because, you know, coffee is far, far, far too cheap. Uh, and so we're sort of forcing people to make these kind of decisions because they're trying to squeeze as much value as they can out of it. And one thing that, that's come up I'd love to uh, um, explore a little bit more is, is sort of fiber. So I think, um, you know, when I, when I think about fiber, I, I sort of think about the stuff that, <clears throat> you know, that, that you can't easily uh, digest. So I would naturally have thought, well, that's all the stuff that's left behind in the process that you're talking about, James, right? You said, I think that like two thirds of this um, wasn't going to dissolve into the into the hot water. So I was like, okay, I get that. That's fiber. You chew on it. It tastes terrible. Most of us have probably had coffee grounds uh, in our mouth before. But um, I think what's, what's really surprising is to say, well, in the coffee itself, uh, you know, after I've um, I put it out and assuming that it's, you know, it's not a a Turkish coffee with all of its stack at the bottom, like I would have thought, well, there's no fiber in that. That sounds uh, that's sort of, sort of mad. So I don't know, you know, Tim, James, can you can you help us to understand what this this is and and how fiber is, I guess, uh, not as, as straightforward well, as, as maybe yeah, we assumed. A, yeah, it's a bit of a misconception to think of fiber as this sort of husk that can't be dissolved or digested. And just passes through you, you know, and the old concept of roughage was this uh, old fashioned science of uh, how we discuss fiber. And it, actually, it's incredibly complex and understudied, and can, and there's soluble forms that do dissolve in water, and there's forms that dissolve in fats, and, uh, and there's, there's forms that stay insoluble and, and just sort of uh, end up as a slime inside inside your gut that do lubricate the gut. So there's all different types of fiber. And this is, I think, what we're just talking about here. And clearly, there's multiple forms of fiber within something like coffee. And that's why some gets left behind. But uh, a large amount does get uh, drunk and get into your into your intestines. Yeah, I think I was I was uh, I was sort of genuinely shocked by this research. I, I think I'd lived a life of, you know, I might have experimented with some resistant starches before, and, and you know, that's not much fun to put in a, a a drink and kind of consume. So the idea that I could get a couple of grams of fiber from coffee 
seemed actually quite shocking to me. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a good amount uh, of what is dissolved from the sort of uh, coffee grounds is fiber, and, and I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, just to put it in context, um, uh, you know, the average uh, American, I think, has 50, or, Amer or Brit, I can't remember which one it is, has somewhere between 13 and 15 grams of fiber a day. And uh, a decent uh, coffee, a filter coffee will have something like one, 1. 1.5 grams of fiber. So if you manage to get uh, 10 cups of coffee, you'd be getting all your uh, fiber that way. Uh, and it just shows you that just having, uh, you know, th three cups of coffee is about a third of your daily intake. Although we know that uh, we need much. We need double that, really, for good health. Um, so, uh, but so fifteen it, is not the target. It's like the sort of the low level that most but, of us are, are taking. Yes, but for many people, it's the main source of their fibre at the moment, which is quite worrying. That that's amazing. And and Tim, I just want to pick up on something else you said, where you said there's many sorts of fibre in coffee. So it's not just one type. Um, that tends to matter, right, as we think about food. Could you explain a bit more? And does that tie into some of these, um, you know, surprising health properties of coffee? It, it may well do, yes. I mean, the complexity of fiber means that this is made up of different compounds, different chemicals, and all of these are, uh, in fact, food for our gut microbes. So each different type of uh, fiber that is something that reaches the lower part of our intestines, our colon is where the gut microbes are, serves as a food for a particular highly specialized microbe that wants that one. So there might be several types of soluble fiber in coffee and each one of those attracts a different set of microbes and different species. And we know that this diversity is really important. So uh, even within one plant, like uh, a coffee bean, there are, are uh, multiple sources that will feed many different types of microbe. And we know the more diversity of species you have in your gut, the healthier uh, you will be. So it's, it's a great example of um, how in the past we haven't really understood this and how the new science is revealing uh, these exciting insights into why, you know, something like coffee, which we thought was bad for us, is actually uh, good for us. And when we look at how coffee affects us, I mean, we've touched on on two things already. You talked about caffeine, um, uh, and then you've talked about sort of this this fiber. Um, are those the two ways that coffee affects us? Are there other ways that coffee uh, affects us when we drink it? Well, it, it obviously has this effect on uh, our, our brain, and uh, the it, it, it um, you know so we normally have these. Uh, chemicals in our brain putting us to sleep. And so clearly one of the things of coffee is to uh, neutralize uh, these chemicals, these adenosine um, uh, molecules, and it, it acts as a, a block of that so that the normal, uh, you can alter the normal uh, tiredness cycle. And this is why coffee wakes you up 20 minutes after taking it. And that's uh, very part of this this neurochemical aspect of it, which is mainly related to the, the uh, caffeine component. And that that's something that uh, can have benefits, but also can have uh, side effects as well. And, and we had a lot of questions on this, actually. Um, so one of the questions was like, how much is too much coffee? And I think that's related, particularly in that context of sleep, but in general. Um, and then a lot of questions about the time of day to drink um, coffee. And Maybe, you know, maybe start with James, because I suspect, again, this is a cultural thing as well as a scientific thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think um, so. Like I said, with caffeine itself, there's a sort of broad guidelines of about 300 milligrams per day uh, is your sort of recommended daily limit, though I have to say my own experience it is so incredibly personal and that people's response to caffeine particularly is is you know a broad spectrum so just because you're below 300 doesn't mean it's the right quantity for you i sort of want to add that in there and actually one of the interesting things about coffee just quickly or caffeine that people don't talk about enough is it's one of the few good legal performance enhancing compounds that are sort of left though it was temporarily banned by the olympic committee for a while so you, you couldn't have too much coffee before running a race because it does increase your power output so 
yeah, yeah co- so caffeine before the gym is a good thing. You'll and and I I think from my own experience, definitely see the benefits of that. It's only about one percent advantage. So, Jonathan, if you're thinking it's going to make, uh, <laughs> if you're an elite athlete, one percent is a lot. But for the average um, weekend gym goer, it may well, not, I, may not I, make. I, I was just thinking that I always really like a cup of tea just before I go to the gym, and uh, this has always made everybody laugh. And now I finally, I mean, let's be honest, it's because I like a cup of tea a lot. But I'm now going to say it's just about pushing that extra one percent. Um, is uh, is brilliant. I've got my, uh, I've got. I think everyone's got their excuse now. For bringing in their super frappuccino uh, into uh, into the gym. What's that, James? I was going to say though the I think the tested quantity was about a two hundred milligram dose, so um, it's quite a lot of caffeine, really. So so just just to sort of caveat my way out of that one just quickly. That's fine. And on on sleep. So I mean, I would say at a personal level. Um, I definitely find that caffeinated drinks affect sleep, and we know that um, sleep is really important for health. Uh, that you know that's come up in in so many of the different um, studies that we and others have been involved with. So I've definitely sort of felt that there's a, a ceiling, which for me is probably about sort of three o'clock that I need to cut back. But interestingly. That wasn't true when I was younger. It's definitely something that has affected me. You know, this is uh, at a personal level sooner. Um, Tim, like, what's going on? Is this, you know, is this true for everybody? They need to stop um, their their caffeine so early in the day. You know, how do we think about figuring out whether you need to stop and at, and at what time? The average levels in the epidemiology tell us that um, <clears throat> things change um, for most people uh, with age and uh, the ability of breaking down the the caffeine uh, <clears throat> so that it's no longer potent and how quickly it comes out of the system. So we know that the half-life, uh, which is the time at which it takes to get to half the dose, so you've got you know half that coffee, um, is, is somewhere between five and seven hours. But that means that it, it could take double that to actually clear the system. And everyone has a different threshold of which, uh, of how that affects them, but also a different rate at which they break it down, just like alcohol. And so they found that um, these averages are fine, but uh, men will uh, actually break down coffee quicker than women. So generally, uh, uh, females will have less, um, a coffee will have a greater effect on them in terms of their sleep. We also know that cigarette smokers um, break down caffeine more. So to get that hit, they need to actually double the amount of intake uh, uh, than uh, non-smokers. And a number of medications also influence this as well. So uh, the oral contraceptive pill is, is another one. So, uh, And then on top of that, you've got this enormous um, perhaps genetic difference between people that uh, just like alcohol, uh, confounds the whole problem so that I think everyone just has to do their own experiments and um, think, don't believe someone else's story about what works for them or not. They should do in their own experiments and try using decaffeinated coffee instead, get someone to switch their, their coffees around so you don't get the placebo effect um, and, and, and test it out for themselves. And, and some people really are absolutely fine drinking a cup of coffee just before going to bed. Others, um, you know, can't have it after 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it's amazing. My, my father-in-law really can have an espresso after dinner and, and no effect whatsoever. Yeah, I can tell you for sure that um, I, I'm wired and even if I fall asleep, you know, it's going to really affect me. I'm going to wake up and uh, and I, and I think Tim, you would definitely say that's cancelling all the all the health impacts of of the coffee if it's if it's damaging your sleep. Absolutely, yes. No, um, anything that damages your sleep has big knock on effects. So you need to use this carefully, and I think we need to start thinking about how to give people advice in a personalised manner. Um, you know that you can test your genes uh, for coffee now if you go to something like Twenty Three and Me, which gives you a rough idea of. Uh, you know, it doesn't explain most of the variation. It will just give you a, a rough idea whether you're particularly sensitive. But I think people doing their own experiments um, is probably the, the, the better uh, way forward. And um, yeah, and, and you can get used to it as well. I mean, I think as James has hinted at, 
uh, if you did start as a child, probably you build up a, a pretty good resistance, you know, to this so that you need higher doses to actually keep you awake. Um, that's the other the other factor here. Although I'm not saying we should be giving all our kids uh, large espresso. <laughs> I was going to say, to school, is, that, but... is, that, is that your official <laughs> advice as a doctor, Tim? <laughs> well, it might be better than most of the breakfast cereals we're giving them at the moment. So, you know, the Italian breakfast might be the... Uh, might be the, the the solution. We'll have to see. So I, I don't think I'm going to be pushing studies. coffee on my <laughs> children quite yet. So, so one natural consequence, I guess, is is to think about decaffeinated coffee if if you like the taste. Um, and uh, we actually had lots of questions about this. Um, uh, maybe like, what is it to start with? Um, and and then a lot of questions about is it safe? Do you get the same health effects? Um, but but maybe start, James, by just helping us to understand what it is. So decaffeination is done to the coffee as a sort of the, the raw seed stage. So it's done before roasting. Uh, and I think legally they have to remove or the coffee, the, the coffee has to be sort of 99.5% caffeine free at the end of the whole thing. So it's an effective sort of process from that point of view. It's done a number of different ways. And uh, essentially what they're all trying to do is it, sort of bind the caffeine into a solvent, into a solution, uh, without taking other things out of the coffee as well. You can do it with water, and there's a process you'll see called the Swiss water process that sounds very lovely. Um, there's one uh, done with uh, what's called supercritical carbon dioxide. Essentially, if you compress CO2 enough, it becomes a liquid, and you can use that as a solvent. That's a, a, a gross simplification, but go with me. And then there are other processes that have lovely names like the sugarcane process, which sounds great. Um, the proper name for that is the ethyl acetate process, which scares people. So you'll tend to see sugarcane process on the packaging. All of it is completely safe. It's absolutely safe. And done well should have a very limited impact on taste. Decaffeinated coffees are harder to work with as a roaster and they go stale faster. So if you're a decaf lover, you really want to be buying fresh roasted beans and grinding them yourself for the best experience. And you can have truly, truly delicious decaf coffee. So it can be an uncompromised taste experience or a barely compromised one. Most of the time, it's not that. I was going to say, I think for many people will be surprised by that. I think it's right. got a reputation, um, I guess, like many other sort of processed foods as sort of, um, you know, much worse for you. So I think hearing someone who's, you know, such an aficionado be so positive is surprising. T tell us a little bit more about that, I think. It may open up a lot of, uh, uh, of, of ears, I suspect, to maybe rethink this. No, no. I, I think from my point of view, I'm, I'm going to be talking about sort of specialty coffee very much still. So this is going to be sort of smaller companies roasting coffees from distinct places. You'll see farm names or, or sort of more precise regions on the bag. As I said, this, this process of decaffeination actually changes the density of the coffee bean. It becomes more porous. So it roasts very differently. And many roasters don't pay enough attention to this because they don't see it as an important product. There's a sort of snobbery against decaf inside the coffee industry too. But there are people who are passionate about decaf because this is coffee for people who just like the taste, not even the, the, the caffeine. They're just there for the taste and they get a, a rough deal. So um, yes, if it's roasted fresh and if it's roasted carefully, it can be good. It will look like a darker roast than it is because it's it's less dense the, the oils will come to the surface of the coffee bean it'll look like a dark roast it's often not actually but it goes stale really fast uh because a lot more air can get into the inside of the coffee bean uh it's just much less dense so if you are buying it as whole bean using it within two three weeks and and sort of grinding it fresh each time you'll have a a great experience if you're buying pre-ground decaf from a supermarket unfortunately that is you know, it's a, a subjective thing. I would say stale. It's it's food safe. It's totally fine to consume, but it is not what it once was from a flavor perspective. So freshness is is the key. It's the secret. Buy decaf from a passionate roaster who wants to sell you decaf. Some roasters are sort of death before decaf and others are like, no, 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 this should be great. Let's make it great. And James, do you let decaf, decaf pass, your, pass your lips on a regular basis? Absolutely. Because I'm, I, I definitely suffer um, from caffeine. So my cutoff is about three o'clock in the day. I tend to drink no more than three cups of coffee a day. I, I doing tastings. We don't. You know, it's like a wine tasting. You're not drinking it. You're typically spitting it out afterwards. So I'm quite cautious around this. But there's times at four in the afternoon where I just want a coffee. I want that that sort of moment, that sort of ritual of coffee. And so I drink decaf, and I really enjoy it. 
it can be really good. Instant decaf, are you going to give us a comment on that? That's, oh, uh, I, I could, but it's complicated. So, so it, it, there are they, there exists in the world high convenience decaf, but that's as far as I'll touch on. So it's possible, but highly rare. And Tim, any any view from on your side on on decaf? Is it as healthy as caffeinated um, coffee? That's a great question, and um, there is some indication that it it uh, is nearly as uh, as healthy. Um, and so most of the studies, you know, they they lack a lot the big numbers of uh, decaffeinated coffee drinkers. So the confidence intervals are are a bit wider, but. Uh, most of the data, not all, most of the data points to decaf having uh, some health properties as well. So I think it, it, this all adds up that if it's well-made coffee that still contains polyphenols that hasn't been killed off in the industrial process of making perhaps the cheapest instant coffees, then uh, there will be some uh, uh, benefits also because the polyphenols is, uh, are still there and the fiber is still there, and I think uh, that's that's really a good point. And uh, I was I was I was brought up on uh, saying that basically decaf was the devil, and it it also tasted revolting when I was uh, a teenager. So it put me off for a long time. But in my research, seeing that in blind tastings to coffee snobs, the decaf version could often win. I think is is a real turnaround. So I think we we need to change our minds about uh, high quality decaf. And wh while we're talking about sort of the making of the coffee, um, you know, we got to the to the roasting in the end. Maybe to sort of come to the final um, question, thinking about it again from from a health perspective. Does it make any difference? The, I, I think we're generally hearing that instant coffee is probably not very good. Once we're outside of instant coffee, does it does it matter? There's a lot of false stuff saying that drip coffee was ba particularly bad for your heart. Uh, and this all came from studies in Scandinavia where they, this is very common. But I think all those studies were found to be spurious. So uh, the current evidence doesn't really distinguish um, the types the types of coffee uh, in terms of the heart disease. I don't think we've done direct contrasting trials yet of different types of coffee. But uh, I think if you go for the, uh, the good quality ones, uh, then you're much more likely to have a, a healthy outcome. But I don't, I think you can go with your personal preference, you know, whether you prefer the percolator, the, the drip, or the espresso, uh, there's no clear evidence that, that uh, one is healthier than the other at the moment. And James, anything? Uh, I think you said at the beginning that maybe we were free, but I, I find it hard to believe you haven't got a preference, really. Oh no! Like uh, I have a preference, but I'm not going to say that's right. That's the that's the you know that's a little too much snobbery. I, I like I like filtered coffee. I like paper filtered coffee. Um, I like the clarity of flavor. I don't like bits. I don't mind a French press sometimes, but I, I just like clean tasting cups of coffee. That's just for me. But I like espresso, which is sort of metal filtered too. Within the sort of coffee community, there, there still sort of rages a debate around uh, a couple of, um, I think, lipids in coffee. Uh, I think Cafe All is one of them, and I, for the life of me, cannot remember the name of the other one, uh, because there have been occasional papers sort of correlating these uh, two, two heart disease. But I know the world of correlating dietary cholesterol to blood cholesterol is a complicated world that I never, ever, ever want to get into, uh, sort of into. Um, you know, I, I think coffee drinking broadly seems to be healthy. And, and, you know, I think the bigger Scandinavian studies have shown coffee drinkers have sort of lower or cause mortality than non-coffee drinkers. And that's good news to me. Uh, and, I, you know, it's not that I want to stop reading there, but I think that's, that's a, you know, I think coffee is ultimately a good and healthy thing. But like all things, you know, the the dose is the poison, so to speak. So like a little moderation, a little awareness, I think, for a lot of people. I think that's where things run out of control, where they, they're like, oh, God, I had five or six cups of coffee today. I feel a bit weird. Like, I think being mindful around your coffee consumption is a, is a good thing. And we haven't touched on a few other health side effects of coffee. Um, it, it's not a diet. I mean, some people might notice they go to the toilet more, uh, have a pee more when they're having coffee. And there is uh, some evidence that it causes increased sensitivity of the bladder. And 
you might have noticed this when you have three coffees in succession, you suddenly go into lots of Zoom calls and or, or meetings and you have to leave the room, which has happened to me. Um, but it, it's not a diuretic, but it, it does seem to have, uh, when you have large doses, an effect on the bladder wall that makes you more likely to go to the toilet. So that's something to be look out for. Some people do find it as a useful um, sort of laxative and helps them, uh, which is generally a, a good thing uh, if you get the dose right. Um, so there are a number of these, these, these health issues which are very personalized and will affect some people and not others. And I think it's just important to realize that they can occur. And again, a sign that you need to maybe titrate the dose. If you are if you are going to the toilet every fifteen minutes, then uh, something something's wrong. Though I will say the whole stimulating the bowel thing it really threw me for quite a long time because of how rapidly it happens for people. So it, it's clearly not a kind of traditional sort of digestive reaction, so to speak, because you'll people will experience that within a few minutes of drinking coffee. So clearly, there's a sort of hormone. Uh, release tied to the experience of drinking coffee rather than it's getting all the way down and, and sort of stimulating your bowels that way. It's a sort of interesting mechanism from that perspective. You know, many, many people time their trips to the toilet by their, their coffee. That's right. So they, that's why they have to leave the house, you know, uh, you know the coffee before, <laughs> before you leave the house, not, as, not when you're on the bus. No, I, I think that's right. And, and there are people, right, um, uh, particularly people who have sort of digestive issues sort of um, um, who for whom coffee is, is a challenge if it's tied in with other things, right? And so it is definitely one of the things when you're going through exclusion diets and things like this that is often looked at. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I think, I guess that ties into this story about you can say that on average something is is healthy, but it means doesn't always mean for you as an individual that it's the, um, you know, it's the best possible thing that you can do. So, so the the other topic I think we've talked a lot about coffee and what it does all in its sort of um, in its natural state. If you can describe uh, all the processing that's just been done as natural, uh, we had lots of questions about what happens when you start to add things to coffee, and basically the questions are all around dairy, right? Lots of people are used to drinking milk, um, and for many of us, when we go to uh, a store to buy this, we we get a coffee which is a you know a latte or a super duper frappuccino. Is it still healthy, Tim? Um, well, you're still getting the same ingredients, obviously, if you add milk to it, but you're getting uh, the milk. So generally, my view on milk is that it's relatively neutral. Um, it's definitely not a health drink. Uh, f for some people, you know, it possibly slightly negative, but I don't think it. Uh, there's any evidence it disrupts any of the benefits of coffee on its own. It's obviously giving you um, some extra fats and some other um, calories and may have an effect um, indirectly. I mean, ob obviously, you know, I, I actually like, you know, the Italian way of uh, having a macchiato where you basically just have about four drops of sort of frothy milk on the top, uh, which has any, you know, just to take the edge off any any bitterness uh, but you know the habit of having half milk and half coffee i think you do realize that having a lot of milk in your diet is probably not a good thing and so i think people should perhaps cut back on the milk but milk per se i don't think uh, uh, is a major worry for most people but uh, of course some people do have uh, lactose intolerance or uh, in most parts of the world so we have to be aware of that. But I think in general, uh, the other, it, it's not bad. The only other caveat here is some people, uh, if they're into restricted time eating, will, uh, most, most practitioners will have a black tea or a black coffee uh, and not think that they're breaking their fast. And if you add lots of milk to that, then uh, it does definitely stimulate um, the uh, insulin glucose pathways and so would break the fast. So that might be just another consideration to get people to experiment with trying to get used to having uh, coffee without milk. Because I think many people uh, in the UK and the US are not used to it. Um, and I think it's, it's something that just, you know, it's a bit of training and culture 
uh, you, you know, you just go to the southern Mediterranean, you just don't see people putting milk uh, in their coffee unless occasionally at breakfast time. And James, any strong opinion from from your side about it? Is it sacrilege to add milk to this uh, to this drink? No, I mean milk is one of nature's great bitter blockers, and so you know I, I think from that perspective, it, it, it does a great job increasing palatability of what is ultimately often a very bitter, quite harsh product. The better the coffee is, and better is a very difficult word to use here, but generally lighter roasts, more expensive, higher grown coffees have lower bitterness levels and so they they need less milk to become palatable so there's a sort of benefit there to drinking quote unquote better coffee or sort of more premium coffee from that perspective um i'm not a m milk drinker it's not for me and uh you know maybe my mind was poisoned earlier the the, the beginnings of coffee culture said this is from 1500s coffee and milk gave you leprosy that was a <laughs> widely held belief in, in a great deal of europe in the sort of uh, uh middle of the 1600s really uh that was a sort of no-go uh, which I found kind of fascinating. So that seems like a good reason to keep the milk out of one's coffee then. <laughs> uh, we've obviously uh, evolved our understanding since then, but it's just a, a sort of fascinating tidbit from history. Um, but yes, like um, I, I totally understand the sort of why people reach for, for milk, why they reach for cream, or why they reach for sugar. But I think that, that you know, that this is the upside of uh, quote unquote better coffee, so to speak. What, what that's trying to achieve is more flavor, less bitterness. So that's the, that's the thinking there. In, in the UK, a lot, of, a lot of the coffee you get in Czech coffee chains is not very good, is quite bitter. And in a way, drink it with milk, maybe the only palatable way to to have it. And it's a bit of a vicious circle because the more people buy uh, lattes, the the more strength, the more they make the, the roast uh, bitter to compensate. So it, I think it'd be nice to start getting people to experiment without it and see what the, the coffee really tastes like that they're, they're, they're trying to get at. I, I would agree 100%. So, but I would, you know. Brilliant. Well, I think that's been an amazing tour. I think we could keep talking about this for uh, hours, but I'm just going to try and sum up the sort of wide ranging conversation we've had. So first we started with, you know, coffee is actually the seed of a tropical plant, uh, which is not how we tend to think about it. Uh, and that amazingly, the caffeine that we are all in search of is actually an insect repellent. Coffee is healthy. So uh, ignore everything that we might have been told in, in past years. And uh, the big reasons that we, we think behind Behind that is about all the fiber that you get from it, and particularly these polyphenols that, that Tim was, was talking about. There's a complex process of, of making it. There are two sorts of plants, and I think, James, you said the Arabica is the better plant, um, and also lower caffeine, which is interesting as you uh, I think that it's not always the same caffeine across these. There's a fermentation process involving microbes, uh, and then you roast it, which apparently is a bit like cooking something in a tumble dryer, uh, which is uh, a, a wonderful uh, image that I'm going to uh, try with my son later. Um, and that the roasting from James's perspective is sort of the most important step here for really uh, affecting the, the flavor. Is that right, James? I think probably so, yes. There really is fiber in this, um, and the fiber is not just uh, roughage. So, you know, the reason why you, you know, I might be struggling with this is because I've got the wrong uh, vision. Uh, a lot of fiber can be soluble in water. So if you're having three or four cups of, uh, of of coffee, you know, you might be getting close to half of the average fiber intake in, in the US or, or, or the UK. So that that's quite a lot. But coffee has a lot of impact on us. The stimulation comes from a lot of chemicals, but particularly caffeine. Uh, it really does affect your sleep. James says you can make your coffee the way you like. So there is not one single uh, answer, although I think we all heard that he does it with filter paper. So I'm sure we're all going away thinking that's obviously the best way, really. Decaffeinated coffee is not as bad as perhaps we've been led to believe by um, sort of thinking about it as very cheap uh, coffee. Uh, and then finally, I think we talked about milk. And um, Tim said, you know, it doesn't do any harm to the, the health properties of the coffee. You're just adding milk, almost as if you drink it on, on the side. And on the health side, you know, milk is neither a super health drink nor, nor something that's really bad for most people. It's sort of neutral. So you can think about um, that. Just before we go, I have one final quick question from uh, one of our listeners, George, on in Instagram, who said, does coffee dehydrate you? Which is something that people talk about a lot on social media. Uh, what's the answer? Quick answer is no. There's no evidence it's a diuretic. So you can keep drinking your coffee and uh, you'll be all right. 
Wonderful. James and Tim, I really enjoyed that conversation. Thank you so much for taking time to talk about uh, this wide range from health to uh, to taste. Uh, and I think everybody will be going away and drinking a cup of coffee right now. This was great. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you to James Hoffman and Tim Spector for joining me on Zoe Science and Nutrition today. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please be sure to leave us a review and subscribe. If you're interested in learning more about Zoe and the best foods for your body, you can head to joinzoe.com slash podcast and get 10% off your personalized nutrition program. Finally, if this episode left you with questions, please send them in on Instagram or Facebook and we will try to answer them in a future episode. As always, I'm your host, Jonathan Wolfe. Zoe Science and Nutrition is produced by Fascinate Productions with support from Sharon Feder and Megan McPherson here at Zoe. See you next time.